Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds. Don't nobody believe nothing these days, which is why I haven't told nobody the story I'm about to tell you. And the truth is, you probably ain't gonna believe it either. Gonna think I'm lying or I'm losing it. But I'm telling you, the story is true. It happened to me. Really, it did. It did so. My name is Will. William. William Holloman. But to my friends and people who know me know me, just Will. So call me Will. Because after I tell you what I'm about to tell you, you'll either want to be my friend or not want to be my friend at all. Either way, you'll know me know me. I'm only William to my mother, my brother Sean, whenever he was trying to be funny. Now, I'm wishing I would have laughed more at his dumb jokes because the day before yesterday, Sean was shot and killed. I don't know you, don't know your last name, if you got brothers or sisters or mothers and fathers or cousins that's like brothers and sisters or aunties and uncles that be like mothers and fathers. But if the blood inside you is on the inside of someone else, you'll never want to see it outside of them. The sadness, it's so hard to explain. Imagine waking up to someone, a stranger, got you strapped down, got pliers shoved in your mouth, gripping your tooth somewhere in the back, one of the big important ones, and rips it out. Imagine the knocking in your head, the pressure pushing through your ears and the blood pooling. But the worst part, the absolute worst part, is the constant slipping of your tongue into a new empty space where you know a tooth is supposed to be, but it ain't no more. It's so hard to say, Sean's dead. Sean's dead. Sean's dead. So strange to say, so sad, but I guess not surprising, which I guess is even stranger and even sadder. The day before yesterday, me and my friend Tony were outside talking about whether or not we'd get any taller now that we were 15. When Sean was 15, he grew a foot, maybe a foot and a half, and that's when he gave me all his clothes that he couldn't fit. Tony keeps saying he'd hope he'd grew because even though he was the best ball player around here, our age, he was also the shortest. And everyone knows you can't go all the way when you're small unless you can really jump, like fly. And then there were shots. Everybody ran, ducked hid, tucked themselves tight, did what we all been trained to do, pressed our lips to the pavement and prayed the boom followed by the buzz of a bullet ain't meet us. After the shots, me and Tony waited, like we always do, for the rumble to stop before picking up our heads and poking our heads out to count the bodies. This time, there was only one, Sean. I've, I've never, never been, been in an, in an earthquake. earthquake. Don't know if this was even close to how they are, but the ground definitely felt like it opened up and ate me. Things that always happen whenever someone is killed around here. Number one, screaming. Not everybody screams, usually just moms, girlfriends, daughters. In this case, it was Letitia, Sean's girlfriend, on her knees, kissing his forehead between shrieks. I think she hoped her voice would, would somehow keep him alive, would, would clot the blood, but I think she knew deep down in the deepest part of her downness, she was kissing him goodbye. And my mom, moaning low, not my baby, not my baby, why? Hanging over my brother's body like a dimmed light post. Number two, sirens. Lots and lots of sirens howling, cutting through the sounds of the city, except the screams. The screams are always heard over everything, even the sirens. Number three, questions. Cops flash lights in our faces and we all turn to stone. Did anybody see anything? A young officer asked. He looked honest, like he ain't never done this before. You can always tell a newbie, they, they ask questions, uh, like they really expect answers. Did anybody see anyone? I ain't seen nothing. Marcus Andrews, the neighborhood know-it-all said, even he knew better than to know anything. In case you ain't know, uh, gunshots make everybody deaf and blind, especially when they make somebody dead. Best to become invisible in times like these. Everybody knows that. Even Tony flew away. I'm not sure if the cops asked me questions. Maybe, maybe not. Couldn't hear nothing. Ears filled up with heartbeats, like my head was being held underwater, like I was holding my breath. Maybe I was, maybe I was hoping I could give some back to Sean, or maybe somehow join him. When bad things happen, we can usually look up and see the moon big and bright shining over us. That always made me feel better, like there's something up there beaming down on us in the dark. But the day before yesterday, when Sean died, the moon was off. Somebody told me once a month, the moon blacks out and becomes new and the next night be back to normal. I'll tell you one thing, 
the moon is lucky it's not down here where nothing is ever new. I stood there, mouth clenched tight enough to grind my teeth down to dust and looked at Sean lying there like a piece of furniture left outside, like a stained up couch draped in a gold chain. Them fuckers ain't even snatch it. Random thought. Blood soaking into a t-shirt, blue jeans and boots looks a lot like chocolate syrup when the glow from the street lights hit it. But I know it ain't. Nothing sweet about blood. I know it ain't like chocolate syrup at all. In his hand, a corner store plastic bag, white with red letters. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a nice day. In that bag, special soap for my mother's eczema. I've seen her scratch until it bleeds, pick at the pus, bubbles, and flaky scales, curse the invisible thing trying to eat her. Maybe there's something invisible trying to eat all of us if, if we are our beef. Beef gets passed down uh, like name brand t-shirts around here. Always too big, never ironed out. Gets inherited like a, a trunk of fool's gold or treasure map leading to nowhere. Came knocking on my brother's life, kicked the damn door down and took everything except his gold chain. Then the yellow tape that says do not cross gets put up and there's nothing left to do but go home. That tape lets people know that this is a murder scene, right? As if we ain't already know that. The crowd backs its way into buildings and down blocks until nothing is left but the tape. Sean was zipped into a bag and rolled away. His blood added to the pavement uh, galaxy of bubblegum stars. The tape framed like it was art. And the next day, kids would play mummy with it. Back on the eighth floor, I locked myself in my room and put a pillow over my head to muffle the sound of my mom's morning. She sat in the kitchen sobbing into her palms, which she peeled away only to lift glass to mouth. With each ship came a brief silence. With each brief silence, I snuck in a breath. I felt like crying, which felt like another person trapped behind my face, tiny fists punching the backs of my eyes, feet kicking my throat at the spot where the swallow starts. Stay put, I whispered to him. Stay strong, I whispered to me, because crying is against the rules. The rules. Number one, crying. Don't, no matter what, don't. Number two, snitching. Don't, no matter what, don't. Number three, revenge. If someone you love gets killed, find the person who killed them and kill them. Invention of the rules. Ain't come from my brother, his friends, my dad, my uncle, the guys outside, the hustlers and the shooters, and definitely not from me. Another thing about the rules, they weren't meant to be broken. They were meant for the broken to follow. Our bedroom, a square yellow paint, two beds, one to the left of the door, one to the right, two dressers, one in front of the bed on the left of the door, and one in front of the bed to the right. In the middle, a small TV. Sean's side was left perfect, almost. Mine, the right, pigsty, mostly. Sean's wall had a poster of Tupac, a poster of Biggie. My wall had an anagram I wrote in, in messed up scribble with a pencil in case mom made me erase it. Scare equals cares. Anagram. Yeah. Anagram is, is when, when you, you take, take a word, a word and, and rearrange, rearrange the, letters the letters to make another word. And sometimes the words are still somehow connected. Example, canoe is ocean. Same letters, different words, somehow still make sense together, like brothers. The middle drawer was the only thing ever put out of place on Sean's side of the room, like a random jagged tooth in a perfect mouth jammed tight between the top drawers of shirts, folded into neat rectangles stacked like project floors, and the bottom drawer of socks and underwear. Off track, stuck, forced in at an angle. Seemed like the middle drawer was jacked up on purpose to keep me and mom out and Sean's gun in. I won't pretend that Sean was the kind of guy who was home by curfew, the kind of guy who called and checked in about where he was, who he was with, and what he was doing. He wasn't. Not after 18, which was when our mother took her hands off of him, pressed them together, and began to pray. That he wouldn't go to jail, that he wouldn't get Leticia pregnant, that he wouldn't die. My mother used to say, I know you're young, gotta get it out, but just remember, when you're walking in the nighttime, make sure the nighttime ain't walking into you. But Sean probably had his headphones on, Tupac or Biggie. So usually, I ended up going to bed at night, curled up on my side of the room, eventually falling asleep staring at the half-empty bottles of cologne 
on top of Sean's dresser and the jacked up middle drawer alone. But I never touched nothing because it's no fun hiding from headlocks half of the night, which is why I never touched nothing of his, no more. It used to be different. When I was 12 and he was 16, we would talk trash till one of us passed out. He would tell me about girls and I would tell him about pretend girls who he pretended were real too, just to make me feel good. He would tell me stories about the best rappers that ever were, Biggie and Tupac, but I always wondered if that was just because they were dead. People always love people more when they're dead. And when I was 13, Sean welcomed me into teenage life with a spritz of his almost grown cologne, said my girlfriend, my first girlfriend, would like it. But she hated it, so I broke up with her because to me, her nose was funny acting. Sean thought that was stupid and funny, but worthy of joking me, calling me William, worthy of a headlock that felt like a hug. Now the cologne will never drop lower in the bottles and I'll never go to sleep again believing that touching them or any of his will lead to an arm around my neck. But it feels like an arm around my neck, wrenching, just thinking about how I'll never go to sleep again believing him or believing he will eventually come home because he won't. And now I guess I should love him more like he's my favorite, which is hard to do because he was my only brother and already my favorite. Suddenly, our room seemed lopsided, cut in half, half empty, half cold, half curious about that one drawer in the middle of it all. The middle drawer called to me, its awkward off-centeredness, a sign that what was in it could and should be used to set things straight. I yanked and pulled and snatched and tugged at the drawer until it opened just more than an inch, just wide enough for my 15-year-old fingers to slither and touch cold steel. Nickname, a cannon, a strap, a piece, a biscuit, a burner, a heater, a chopper, a gat, a hammer, a tool, for rule number three. Which brings me to Carlson Riggs. He was known around here for being as loud as police sirens, but as soft as his first name. People said Riggs talked so much trash because he was short, but I think it was because his mom made him take gymnastics when he was a kid. And when you wear tights and know how to do cartwheels, it might be a good idea to also know how to defend yourself, or at least talk like you can. not Riggs and Sean were so-called friends, but the best thing he ever did for Sean was teach him how to do a penny job. The worst thing he ever did for Sean was shoot him. A penny drop is when you hang upside down on a monkey bar and swing back and forth, harder and harder, until just the right moment when you release your legs and go flying through the air, hopefully landing on your feet. It's all about timing. If you let your legs go too early, you'll land on your face. If you let your legs go too late, you'll land flat on your back. So you have to time it perfectly to get it right. Sean taught me how to time it perfectly. If you could do a penny drop or a backflip, no cartwheels, you were the king. Sean could do both, so he was the king around here, to me and Tony, and all our friends. But he made sure I was the prince, in case you ain't know. Reasons I thought, or knew, Riggs killed Sean. Number one, turf. Riggs moved to a different part of the hood where the dark suns hang and bang and be wild. He wanted to join so he wouldn't, look, he wouldn't be looked at like all bark no more, and instead could have a backbone built for him by the bite of his block boys who wait for anyone to cross the line into their territory, which happens to be nine blocks from our building and in the same neighborhood as the corner store that sells the special soap my mother sent Sean out to get for her the day before yesterday. Number 1.1, survival tactics, made plain. Get down with somebody or get beat down by somebody. Number two, crime shows. I grew up watching crime shows with my mother, always knew who the killer was way before the cops, it's like a gift, anagrams and solving murder cases. Number three, had to be. I had never held a gun, never even touched one, heavier than I expected, like holding a newborn, except I knew the cry would be much, 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 much louder. A noise from the hallway, my mother stumbling to the bathroom, her sobs leading the way. I quickly slapped the switch on the wall, dropping the room into darkness, dropping myself into bed, pushing the pistol under my pillow like a lost tooth. Sleep ran from me for what seemed like forever, hid from me like I used to hide from Sean before finally peeking out from behind the pain. I woke up in the morning and tried to remember if I dreamed about anything. I don't think I did, so I pretended that I dreamed about Sean. It made me feel better about going to sleep the night he was murdered. But I also felt guilty for waking up, for breathing in, for stretching, yawning, and reaching under the pillow. I wrapped my fingers around the grip, placing them over Sean's prints like little brother holding big brother's hand again, walking me to the store, teaching me how to do a penny drop. If you let go too early, you'll land on your face. If you let go too late, you'll land on your back. To land on your feet, you gotta time it just right. 
In the bathroom, in the mirror, my face sagged like sadness was trying to pull the skin off. Zombie. I'd slept in my clothes, the stench of death and sweat trapped in the cotton like fish grease. I looked and felt like shit. And so what? I stuck the cannon in the waistband and the back of my jeans, the handle sticking out like a steel tail. I covered it with my too big t-shirt, the name brand hand me down from Sean. The plan was to wait for Riggs in front of his building. Me and Sean were always over his house before Riggs joined the gang. And since then, Sean had been up that way a bunch of times to get Mom's special soap. I figured it would be safest if I went in the morning. If I timed it right, none of his crew would be out yet. No one would ever suspect me. I'd hit his buzzer, get him to come down and open the door. Then I'd pull my shirt over my mouth and nose and do it. In the kitchen, the sun burst through the window, bathing my mother, who slept slumped at the table, her head resting in the nest of her red swollen arms. She'd probably been scratching all night, maybe trying to scratch the guilt away. I wanted to wake her and tell her that it wasn't her fault, but I didn't. Instead, with the pistol heavy on my back, I stepped lightly over the creaky parts of the floor, trying not to wake her and lie about where I was going and break her heart even more. The yellow light that lined the hallway buzzed like the lightning bugs me and Sean used to catch when we were kids. We scooped them into washed out mayo jars, four or five at a time. Sean would twist the lid tight and the two of us would sit on a bench and watch them fly around, bumping into each other, trapped, until one by one, their lights went out. At the elevator, back already sore, uncomfortable. Guns strapped like a brick, rubbing my skin raw with each step. Seemed like time stood still as I reached out and pushed the button. White light surrounded the black arrow. Down, 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 down. It's a strange thing that happens in the elevator, in any elevator. Every time somebody gets in, they check to see if the button for the floor they're going to is lit. And if it isn't, they push it, then face the door. That's it. They don't speak to the people already in the elevator, and the people already in the elevator don't speak to the newcomer. Those are elevator rules, I guess. No talking, no looking. Stand still, stare at the door, and wait. 9.08.02 a.m. A guy got on. Definitely older than me, but not old. Medium brown skin, slim, low haircut, part on the side. No hair on his face, none at all, not even a mustache. Gold links dangling around his neck like a magic rope. Check to make sure the L button was lit, going down too. L stood for loser when we were kids. So Sean and I would stand in an empty elevator and wait for someone to get on and push L. And when they did, we would giggle because they were the loser and me and Sean were winners on a funny and victorious ride down to the lobby. I thought about this when the man with the gold chains got on and checked to see if the L button was already glowing. I wondered if he knew that in me and Sean's world, I'd already chosen to be a loser. It's uncomfortable when you feel like someone is looking at you, but only when you not looking. I've seen girls waiting at the bus stop make men pitiful pieces of putty, curling backwards, stretching and straining every muscle just to get a glimpse of what Sean and a lot of men around here call the world. But there were no women on this elevator, so there were no worlds to be checking for. But he kept checking anyway, not knowing that if he kept checking anyway, he'd get a world of trouble. 9.08.04 a.m. Do I know you? I asked, irritated, freaked out. The man smiled, adjusted the chains around his neck, looked me straight in the eyes, dead in the face. You don't recognize me? He asked, his voice deep, familiar. I looked harder, squinted, trying to place the face. Nah, not really, I said. He smiled wide, a jagged mouth, sharp and shark-like, then turned around so that I could see the back of his t-shirt. A silk screen photo, him squatting low, middle fingers in the air, and a smile made of triangles. R.I.P. Buck, you'll be missed forever. My stomach jumped into my chest, or my chest fell into my stomach, or both. I knew him. Buck? I stumbled backwards. Couldn't be, couldn't be. Ain't that what it say? He said, facing me. Couldn't be, couldn't be. But I thought, I stuttered. I, I thought, I thought, you thought I was dead, he said, straight up, straight up. I rubbed my eyes over and over and over and over again, tripping, 
never smoked or nothing like that. Don't know high life, don't know bad trips. Don't know dead man's supposed to be talking to me though. Yeah, I did. I said, hoping he would come back with, I'm not dead, or I faked my death, or something like that. Or maybe I'd wake up, sit straight up in bed, the gun still tucked under my pillow, my mother still asleep at the kitchen table, a dream. Buck looked at me, noticing my panic, softly said, I am. I did all the wake up tricks, pinched the meat in my armpit, slapped myself in the face, even tried to blink myself awake, blink, 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 but Buck, I know what you're thinking, that I was scared to death, but no need to be afraid. I had known Buck since I was a kid, the only big brother Sean had ever had. Sean knew Buck better than I did, knew Buck longer than we'd known our dad. I take it back, I was scared. What if he had come to get me, to take me with him? What if he had come to catch my breath? Anagram number one, alive, avail. 908, catching my breath, I asked. So why are you here? I wiped the corners of my mouth, thought, please don't say you've come to take me. Please don't say I'm dead. Please. Actually, he said, doing the bus stop, lean back again. I came to check on my gun. My response. Then, finally, in an almost whisper, he added, your tail is showing. I put my hand behind my back, felt the imprint of the piece like another piece of me, an extra vertebrae, some more backbone. Thought about moving it to the front, but Sean used to always say, dogs, even snarling ones, tuck their tails bet between their legs, a sign of fear, a signal of bluff. I remember when I gave that thing to Sean, Buck said, he was around your age, told him he could hold it for me, taught him how to use it too, taught him the rules, made him promise to put it somewhere you couldn't get it. And I replied, with as much tough in my voice as I could, but I got it. And I'm glad I found it, because I'm gonna need it. I explained, Sean's dead now. No need to tiptoe around it. Plus, I figured Buck already knew. Figured dead, no dead stuff. Damn, dumb thing to think. Happened last night. Followed him from the store, caught him slipping. Gave him two to the chest, right outside our building. I said, anger sour in the back of my throat. But I know it was the dark suns. Rigs in them. Had to be. Buck folded his arms. I see, he said, shaking his head. His mouth fading into frown. So what did you do about it? My eyes turned to razor blades. I'm about to do what I gotta do. What you would have done. I squared. Follow the rules. 9.08 a.m. The elevator rumbled and vibrated and knocked around like the middle drawer, like something off track. Scared the hell out of me. What's, ta what's taking this stupid thing so long? I asked, pounding the door as hard as my heart was pounding inside me. The rickety thing has always moved slow, Buck said, grinning. Yeah, but this is ridiculous, I replied. Palms wetting. Might as well relax, Buck said. It's a long way down. Maybe he didn't hear me or didn't take me seriously. Old people always do that. Always try to act like what I'm saying ain't true. Always try to act like I'm not for real. But I was for real. So for real. Relax. I snapped. Relax. I ain't got time to relax. I got work to do. A job to do. Business to handle, I said, feeling myself. My macho between my shaky legs, masking my jumpy heart. Buck laughed. And laughter. When it's loud and heavy and aimed at you, I think can feel just as bad as bullets. Bang. You got work to do? A job to do? Buck teased, wiping laugh tears from his eyes. Right, right. You can follow the rules, huh? Yeah, that's right, I said, opening my stance to let him know this wasn't a game, that I was for real. Buck pressed his finger to my chest, like he was pushing an elevator button, the L button. But you ain't got it in you, Will, he said, cocky. Your brother did, but you, you don't. He asked me if I had even checked to see if the gun was loaded. I hadn't, and now almost shot myself trying to figure out how to. Give it to me before you hurt yourself. Buck clicked something. The clip slid from the grip, like a metal candy bar. 14 slugs, one in the hole, 15 total, he said, slamming the clip back in. How many should there be? I asked. 16, but whatever. 9.08 AM, he held the gun out. I grabbed it, but Buck wouldn't let go. I yanked and yanked, pulled and pulled, but he resisted and resisted, laughed and laughed. 
bucked and bucked. Buck finally let go, and I stumbled into the corner, slamming against the wall like a clown. You don't got it in you, he repeated over and over again, under his unbreath while sliding a pack of cigarettes from his pocket. Tossed one in his mouth, struck a match that sounded like a finger snap. Then the elevator came to a stop. I had half a second to get a grip, grab the grip, tuck the gun, turn around, ignore Buck, catch my breath, stand up straight, act normal, act natural, act like the only rules that matter are the ones for the elevator. A girl stepped in, stood beside me, around my age, fine as heaven, flower dress, low heels, light makeup, lip gloss, cheek stuff, perfume, sweet, fresh, cutting through the cigarette smoke. She checked to make sure Elle was lit and I was, walking my eyes up her legs, the ruffle and fold of her flower dress, her arms, her neck, her cheek, her hair. Then the bus stop leaned back to get a glimpse of the world. But the metal barrel dug into my back, making me wince, making me obvious and whack. 9.08 a.m. I didn't know smoking was allowed in elevators, she said, her small talk smacking with sarcasm. But I was too shook to notice. You can see that, I replied, all goofy, my game no good around ghosts. I wondered if she thought it was me lighting up before she got on. Since she couldn't see Buck in the corner, puffing out, making faces like, get on with it. Uh, of course, it's everywhere, she said, pinching back a cough. She fanned smoke from her face, thumb to Buck, who shook his head and blew vanishing halos. She could see him. She could see him. She could see him. Then she turned around to me and added, I didn't know guns were allowed in elevators either. She could see Buck, but how? I thought, I thought he was my only ghost, only my grand imagination. But when she could see him, could smell his funky cigarette, I knew for a fact this was real. At this point, you probably already don't believe me or think I'm nuts. And maybe I am, but I swear this is all true, I swear. I joined in, fanning the smoke, shaking her comment about the gun, looking at Buck all crazy. But he ain't care. Just leaned back and took another pull on the cig, burning but not burning down. Still long, fire, smoke, but no ash. She brushed her hand against mine to get my attention, which on any other occasion would have been the perfect open for me to flirt, or at least try to do my best impression of Sean, which was his best impression of Buck. But there was a ghost in the elevator, so no go. Plus, it's hard to think about kissing and killing at the same time. She asked, what you need it for anyway? And when I looked confused, pretended to look confused, she ticked tongue to teeth and clarified, the gun. 908, 15 seconds AM. The next exchange was a simple one. I don't mean no harm, but that ain't something you just ask someone you don't even know. I said, still trying to play cool. The girl nodded, replied, you're right, so right. But then she put her hand on my shoulder, her perfume floating from her wrist to just under my nostrils said, but I do know you will. I won't front, I was a little excited. I know I just said flirting on an elevator with a ghost on it was a no-go, but we wouldn't be here on this elevator forever. And Sean always said if a girl says she knows you but you ain't never met her, then she's been watching you, clocking you, checking you. Buck probably taught him that. I hoped it was true. From where is what I came with next, loading up my flirts. You know me from. The girl smiled with her eyes. From the playground, she said. Monkey bars. Very funny, I said, picking up on her trying to play me. I ain't no monkey. I never said you were, she replied. I'm being serious. Well, then you got the wrong guy because I'm too old to be hanging at playgrounds. Yeah, but I knew you when you weren't. She opened her purse, dug around, pulled out a wallet, unfolded it, turned it toward me to flash a photo like white people on movies when they want to show off their kids. But I wasn't trying to see no kids, but there they were. There we were. Me and my friend Danny as kids, eight years old, no knee jeans and hand-me-down t-shirt from John. Flower dress, shorts underneath for Danny, who hung from a monkey bar, tongue hanging from her mouth like pink candy. The sun shining in my eyes, the sunshine in hers. 9.08, 18 seconds AM. You remember this? The girl asked, folding, snapping the wallet shut. Of course, I said, wondering how she knew Danny. 
It was one of the best and worst days of my life. You remember, on this day, she paused, cocking her head to the side, hands on hips, butterfly arms, and continued, I kissed you. My eyes got big. Danny? This was Danny. Danny, standing in front of me. The flower dressed the same. Her face, eight years older than eight years old, but still the same. Yeah, I remember. I remember. I remember that. I remember this. And then I got hung up. And then gunshots, she said. Gunshots. Gunshots like firecrackers coming from everywhere. Danny said her body burned and all she wanted to do was jump outside of herself, swing to somewhere else like we pretended to do on monkey bars. And now I want to throw up. Buck baited. He 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 the cigarette dangling, bouncing with each word like a fishing pole with fish on bait, with hook through head. I told Danny how I remember Sean screaming for us to get down, how he lay on top of us, covering us, smashing us into the dirt. I told her how I remember staring at her the whole time, her eyes wide with brightness, dimming, her mouth open, bubblegum, and blood. I swear sometimes it feels like God be flashing photos of his children, awkward, amazing, tucked in his wallet for the world to see. But the world don't want to see no kids, and God ain't no pushy parent, so he just folds up and snaps us shut. When they said you were gone, I cried all night, I confessed. And the next morning, over hard-boiled eggs and sugar cereal, Sean taught me rule number one, no crying. The way I felt when Danny was killed was a first. Never felt nothing like it. I stood in the shower the next morning after Sean taught me the first rule, no crying, feeling like I wanted to scratch my skin off, scratch my eyes out, punch through something, a wall, a face, anything, so something else could have a hole. Anagram number two, feel equals flee. It's cool to see you, Danny, I said, feeling funny, but meaning every word. She grew up gorgeous. At least she would have. Good to see you too, Will. She grinned. But you still haven't answered my question. What you need a gun for? Then Danny asked, What if you miss? But I won't, I said. But what if you do, she asked. I won't, I said. But how you know, she asked. I just know, I said. But you ever even shot a gun? She asked. Don't matter, I said. Don't matter. Danny was disappointed. Slapped her hands to her face. Tried to wipe away worry. But she couldn't. And I couldn't expect her to. I looked back at Buck for a bailout. Some help. Something. But he said nothing. Just slid the cigarettes from his pocket and extended it to Danny. Buck offered smoke. I guess this was his way of diffusing the situation. Thank you, Danny said, wiggling one from the box. You smoke? I asked. You shoot? She shot back, slipping it between shiny lips, leaning forward for the light. Buck struck a match, and again the elevator came to a stop. The elevator. A smoke box, gray and thick. Buck and Danny puffed and blew everlasting cigs. Thought when the doors opened, the smoke would rush out. But instead, it became a still cloud trapped in a still cube. Cigarette smoke. Ain't supposed to be no wool blanket. Ain't supposed to be no blizzard. No snowy TV. Smoke, like spirit, can be thick, but ain't supposed to be nothing solid enough to hold me. I fanned and coughed, expecting whoever was waiting to wait for the next one. Who wants to get on the elevator full of smoke? What if it wasn't really full of smoke? Still, who wants to get on an elevator with a kid bugging? Swatting and choking on the invisible thick, they'd probably think what you probably think right now. I took a step back to make room for the silhouette to n move through fog to step in. Danny and Buck stood behind me, close enough to feel, but I felt no breath. Two large hands, the largest I've ever seen, rushed through the cloud, hard and fast. Snatched, snatched fistful of my shirt, yoking me by the neck, holding me there until the elevator door closed. Could barely breathe, already and could breathe less could see nothing behind this blanket of gray. Then in one swift motion, the hands released me and slapped me into a headlock, the kind that Sean used to put me in, the kind that all little brothers hate. I could hear laughing, like being held underwater, but playful waves crashing down my head, laughing, laughing, 
laughing under. How do you tell water ain't nothing funny about drowning? When I was finally let up, I looked for Buck, for Danny, for help. They moved to the corner, chuckling, blurry, puffing away. What the hell? I yelped, one hand on my neck, one hand on my tucked, untucked tail. What are you reaching for and why are you reaching for it? The asshole who tried to mash the apple in my neck into sauce taunted. Nephew, 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 he chanted. After all this time, you ain't learned to fight back yet. There are so many pictures of my Uncle Mark in our house, hanging on the wall, hanging on the black, posing with my father, his shorter younger brother. Dressed blade sharp, suits, jewelry, cigarette tucked behind ear, camera ready. Fly like Sean, foreshadowing the flash. Uncle Mark, I let my hand fall to my side, swallowed hard. Am I going insane? Come here, kid, Uncle Mark said. Let me look at ya. I stepped closer. Taller than me, taller than everyone, six foot four, six foot five, six feet deep. Rested his hands on my shoulders, the weight of him, bending me to the knees. Look like your damn daddy, he said, just like him. My mother told me two stories about Uncle Mark. He videotaped everything with a camera his mother and my grandmother bought him for his 18th birthday. Dance battles, gang fights, block parties. But he dreamed of making a movie. Script idea. Boy. Mickey. No game. No girls. Meets. Girl. Jesse. The young girlfriend of. Boy. Mickey's landlord. Girl. Jesse teaches. Boy. Mickey. Everything he needs to know about. Girl. How to impress them. How to treat them. But. Boy. Mickey uses what he learns to get. Girl. Jessie to fall in love with him, but her boyfriend. Boy. Mickey's landlord finds out, kicks him, and... Girl. Jesse out of the building, so they're in love, but they're homeless, but they're happy. Right? Cast casting of the worst, stupidest movie ever. Boy. Mickey to be played by Uncle Mark's little brother, my father. Mickey. Girl. Jesse to, to be played by the younger sister of a girl... Uncle Mark used to date Sherry, my mother. Uncle Mark pulled me in for a hug, but how you hug what's haunting you. And you know, it's weird to know a person you don't know, and at the same time, not know a person you know, you know. 90820, why are you here? I asked Uncle Mark, taking my turn, my time, looking him up and down. Sadness split his face like cold breeze on chapped lip after attempting to smile. I guess he expected me to be excited to see him, and I was sort of, but still. With his hand, he brushed down the front of his shirt, smoothing out wrinkles, straightening himself out. Pants stopped just at the top of his dress shoes, dress shoes tied in perfect bows, leather skinny and creased like he ain't been walking. Brushed and brushed down his chest to stomach, down his thighs. Then squatting, dipped a finger in his mouth and scrubbed the toe of his shoe. A smudge, not there. A better question. He said eyes up to me is why you are here. Random thought number two. Always, always, always be skeptical of a person who answers a question by asking a question. Usually, usually, usually. It's a setup. Anagram number three. Cool. Loco. What you mean? I asked, trying to avoid having to talk about the coldness in my heart and the heater in my waist. What do you mean? He stood up. What do you mean? He repeated, putting hands together, fingertips touching, cracking what sounded like all the knuckles in the world. Listen, kid, don't play me and don't play with me. It's best you turn it loose before I tighten you up. Okay, okay. I begged, trying to hold him off, trying to avoid being knotted up again. Look. They killed Sean last night, Uncle Mark, and and today you woke up ready to make things right, right? I nodded. And the reason why is because for the first time in your life, you realize or at last you think you could kill someone, right? I nodded. Right? He said louder. Right? But to explain myself, I said, the rules are the rules. Uncle Mark huffed, closed his eyes. I wonder if he was thinking about the rules. He knew them like he knew them, 
pass to him, pass them to his little brother, pass them to my older brother, pass to me, the rules. Past represents the future. Uncle Mark squeezed his lips like he was trying to rip them off, then opened his eyes. Okay, Will, he said, all serious. Let's set the scene. What you mean set the scene? I mean, let's play it out. How this whole thing is gonna go down, play it out like a movie, Uncle Mark explained. We'll go back and forth. I'll start from the top. The scene. Will stands over dead brother Sean, two holes in his chest, blood all over the ground. Will takes his mother inside, she cries. He looks for his brother's gun. Will finds the gun, lies down and thinks about the rules. No crying, no snitching, and always get revenge. The next day he decides to find who he knows killed his brother, a guy named Riggs. Will gets in the elevator, goes down to the lobby, walks outside past his brother's blood on the concrete. He continues for nine blocks, gets to Riggs' house, see Riggs, pulls the gun, and I got stuck. Couldn't say nothing else. Couldn't say it. Hoped Uncle Mark would say, cut. But he didn't. Go ahead, finish it. Up until that point, things were running smoothly, but this stupid last part got me caught up. Finish it, Uncle Mark demanded. Danny whimpered, Buck razzed. Okay, okay, I said, trying to calm Uncle Mark down. Will puts the gun out and I stalled. And, and my mouth dried out, words phlegm, trapped in my throat like an allergic reaction to the thought of it all. The scene and, and shoots. Uncle Buck finished it for me, said it slowly, dragging out the shh. Then I could finally, painfully hack it up and shoots for the record. This movie would have been better than that stupid one he was trying to make when he was alive, that's for sure. Maybe not as happy, but definitely better. Story number two about Uncle Mark. Uncle Mark lost the camera his mother got him the one he recorded dance battles and gang fights and block parties in the beginning of his corny ass movie on. Couldn't afford another one. Options. Could have asked Grandma again, but that would have been pointless. Could have stolen one, but he wasn't about to be sweating, so he wasn't about to be running. Could have gotten a job, but working was another one of those things Uncle Mark just wasn't about to be doing. So he did what a lot of people do around here. His plan to sell for one day, one day. Uncle Mark took a corner, pockets full of rocks to become Rolls Future Finance. In an hour, had enough money to buy a new camera, but decided to stick at it. Just through the end of the day, that's all. Just through the end of the day. I'm sure you know where this is going. He held that corner for a day, for a week, for a month, full out pusher, money making pretty boy, target for a ruthless young hustler whose name mom can never remember. That guy took the corner from Uncle Mark, snatched it right from under him, and it wasn't peaceful. Everybody ran, ducked, hid, tucked themselves tight, blew their own eardrums, gouged their own eyes, did what they, they're all been trained to do pretended like yellow tape was some kind of neighborhood flag that don't nobody wave but always flapping in the wind. Uncle Mark should have just bought his camera and shot his stupid movie after the first day. Unfortunately, he never shot nothing ever again, but my father did. Anagram number four, cinema equals Iceman. Random thought number three, not sure what an ice man is, but it makes me think of bad dudes, cold-blooded. 9.08.31 a.m. So anyway, after I said it and shoots, it was like the words came out and at the same time went in, went down into me and chewed on everything inside as if I had somehow swallowed my own teeth and they were sharper than I'd ever known. Meanwhile, 
Uncle Mark reached into his shirt pocket, pulled out two cigarettes. Great, more smoke. I hope the second one wasn't for me. I don't smoke, shit is gross. Plus, people who live in, who real, like me, ain't allowed to smoke in elevators. And what happens in the next movie? Uncle Mark asks, tucking one cig behind his ear, burger rolling the other between his fingers. Nothing. That's it. The end. I shrugged. He positioned the cig in the corner of his mouth, patted his pockets on, for fire. The end, he murmured, looking at Buck, motioning for a light. It's never the end. Uncle Mark said, all chuckle, chuckle. He leaned toward Buck. Never. Buck struck a match and the elevator came to a stop again. And there he was, clear as day, as the door slid open. Recognized him instantly. Been waiting for him since I was three. Mikey Holloman, my father. My pop stepped in the elevator, stood right in front of me, stared, as if looking at his own reflection, as if he'd stepped into a time machine. Moments later, spread my arms, welcomed me into a lifetime's worth of squeeze. Is it possible for a hug to peel back skin of time, the toughened and raw bits, the irritated and irritating dry spots, the parts that bleed? Pop pulled away, noticed his brother, gave Uncle Mark a firm handshake, yanked him in for a half hug, just like on all the pictures. No sound in the elevator except hands popping together and the muted thud of pats on backs. I have no memories of my father. Sean always tried to get me to remember things, like Pop dressing up as Michael Jackson for Halloween, and, after trick-or-treating, riding us up and down on this elevator, doing his best moonwalk, but not enough space to go anywhere, slamming into walls. Sean swore I laughed so hard I farted, stunk up the whole elevator, even, even peed myself. I was only three, and I don't remember that. I've always wanted to, but I don't. I so don't. A broken heart killed my dad. That's what my mother always said. And as a kid, I always figured his heart was for real broken, like an arm or a toy or the middle drawer. But that's not what Sean said. Sean always said our dad was killed for killing the man who killed our uncle. Said he was at a payphone, probably talking to mom, when a guy walked up on him, put pistol to head, asked him if he knew a guy who went by Guy. Didn't know, don't know what Pop said, but that was the end of that story. I always used to ask Sean how he knew that, especially the whole gee thing. He said, Buck told him, said that was Buck's corner. It was then that Buck started looking out for Sean, who at the time was only seven. Buck was 16, but I don't remember none of this either. Hi, Will. My father's voice, brand new to me, deep, some scratch on the tail of each word. How I figured Sean would have sounded, someday. How you been? We're talking to my dad like he was a stranger, even though we hugged like family. I'd, I guess, I said, unsure of what else to say. How do you small talk your father when dad is a language so foreign that whenever you try to say it, it feels like you've got a third lip and a second tongue? I wanted to unload, just tell him about Sean and how mom cried and drank and scratched herself to sleep, how I was feeling, the rules, all that. Wanted to tell him everything in that stuffy elevator but held back because Buck, Danny, and Uncle Mark were watching with warm, weird faces. I already know, Pop said, taking a deep breath. I know, I know, I know. Sadness and love in his voice, I replied, choking down me, choking up. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what to do. I wiped my face with the back of my hand, knuckles rolling over my eyes to catch water before it came down. No crying, not in front of Pop, not in front of Danny, not in front of none of these people, not in front of no one, never. What do you think you should do, he asked. Follow the rules, I said, just like I told everybody else, just like you did. Pop gave Uncle Mark a look when Uncle Mark asked if I had ever heard my father's story. Of course, I said, he was killed at a payphone. Worry washed over Pop's face, opened his mouth to speak, but changed his mind, then changed his mind again. That's not the story we talking about. What you know is how I was killed, Pop explained. But you don't know, you just don't know. When Mark was shot, I was shattered, shifted, never the same again. Like shards of my own heart shiving me up on the inside, just like your mama told you. You and Sean were little, and I couldn't just come home and be a daddy and a husband when I couldn't be a brother no more. 
not after what happened and how it happened. But I didn't cry, didn't snitch, knew exactly who killed Mark, knew I could get him. The rules, taught to me by Mark, taught to him by our pa. That night, I walked two blocks to where Mark used to move, where dirt was done, and waited and waited until finally a dude came from a building, stepped to his corner, Mark's corner, slapped a pack in a customer's clutch. Money was exchanged, and I knew that was my guy, the guy that shot my brother dead in the street. I made my move, hood over my head, gun from my waist, and by the time he saw me, I was already squeezing, pop, pop, pop. By the third, he was down, but I gave him one more just because I was angry, so angry, like something had gotten into me. That something, my pop said, had gotten into him. Must be what my mom meant by the nighttime. Pop said he took off running so fast his sneakers barely touched concrete. Said he took the long way, turned pistol into poof, turned bang bang into hush hush. When I got home, I took a hot shower, hot enough to burn the skin off my body. He said, couldn't kiss your mother, couldn't kiss you boys, good night, just lay naked in the scummy bathtub, the cold porcelain, keeping me from sleep, from nightmares. But you did what you had to do, I said, after listening to my father admit what I had already known. The rules are the rules. Uncle Mark and my father looked at me with hollow eyes, dancing somewhere between guilt and grief, which I couldn't make sense of until my father admitted that he had killed the wrong guy. You ain't kill Guy? I asked, confused. No, I did, Pop confirmed, his voice crumbling. But Guy didn't kill Mark. Guy was just some young kid trying to be tough, trying to make a few friends, a few bucks, a flunky for a guy who killed Mark, he explained. Then, then why, then why you kill him, I asked. I didn't know. He wasn't the right guy, Pop said, a tremble in his throat. I was sure that was Mark's killer. Had to be. I leaned against the wall, next to Danny, thinking, staring at my father, who wasn't my father at all, at least not like I had imagined him, a man who moved with precision, patience, purpose, not no willy-nilly buck bucking off at randoms at random, spent my whole damn life missing a misser that disappointed me. And he stood on the other side of the elevator staring back at me, wasn't sure what he was thinking. Maybe that I was exactly how he had imagined, maybe that disappointed him. Random thought number four. There's this thing I used to see kids at the playground do with their dads. They'd stand on their father's feet, the dads holding the kids by the arms, walking stiff-legged like zombies. The kids had to trust the fathers to guide them because the fathers could see what was coming. But the kids, holding tight to their dads, moved blindly, backward. 9.08.37 a.m. Then Pop made the first move. A step forward, I made the next. Then he took another. We met in the middle. Again, dove into each other. This time, the hug, a mix of I miss you and who are you and I'm confused and I'm cracking and I don't know what the hell to do and where the hell to go. My father's hand gripped my back as I did my best to bury myself in his armpit, to get lost in the new and strangely familiar feeling of fatherhood. And that's when it happened. He pulled the gun from my waistband and put it to my head. I freaked out. What you doing? I shrilled in shock. What the hell you doing? Eye to eye, a tear streaming down his face. Just one, so it ain't really count. Chest aching like a weight crushing me, biscuit tight against my temple. He cocked it, sounded like a door closing. I called out for help, but couldn't see no one. Not Uncle Mark or Danny or Buck or hear them or even smell the dank of tobacco turning to tar. Like it was suddenly just the two of us, me and my dad, both of us apparently losing our minds. Pop stood over me, the gun pressed against the side of my face. It was the first time I had ever had one to my head, first time I had been that close to death, to the end, and at the hand of Pop. Pop? Pop! You would think, I would be thinking about whether or not he could actually do it since he wasn't real, but the hugs were real and the gun was real. Weren't no ghost bullets in that clip, those were real bullets, 15 total, one for every year of my life. My stomach was aching, the quaking world at the bottom of it, and it wasn't long before I could feel myself splitting apart. A warm sensation ran through my lower half of my body, seeping down my leg into my sneakers. Cigarette smoke cut once again, this time by the smell of my own piss. 9.08 and 40 a.m. 
Then Pop uncocked the gun, wrapped his arms around me again, squeezed tight like I was some rag doll, stuffed the gun back into my waistband. I screamed, pushed him away, yelled until my throat stripped, until my words became sizzle. Weak, wet, worried about looking like a punk-ass kid, and my father leaned against the wall, staring, chin up, cocky, quiet, while I exploded. And like old times, Uncle Mark came to his side like a brother, pulled the extra cig, the one tucked behind his ear, handed it to my father, chest heaving. Eyes on me, he threw the cig in his mouth. Buck took his cue. I backed into a corner, wished his stupid elevator would get to L for this whole thing to hurry up and be done. Buck struck a match, and the elevator came to a stop. A stranger. Chubby, light skin, almost white. The type that turns red and burns. Dirty brown hair curled up on his head. Got in the elevator like a normal guy. Didn't acknowledge nobody. No dead body, no live body, no smoke normal. So I figured he was real, which made me real. Embarrassed about the pee, but made me real. Happy I wasn't all the way gone. The thick pale dude stood staring at his blurry reflection in the metal door. When Buck started trying to get his attention, yo, Buck said, psst. The guy didn't budge. Yo, dude, Buck called, reaching for his shoulder. The man turned around. I know you. Buck flashed his big choppy grin. Your name? Frick, right? Only two people who know me know me. The guy said reluctantly, re reaching for Buck's hand. Remember me? Buck said, like a distant relative at a reunion. Buck, he said, showing the back of his t-shirt again. Oh shit, Buck. Head cocked. Buck, arms wide. What's good, man? Nothing is good at all. This is Danny, Mark, Mikey, and you remember Sean. This, his little brother, Will. Before Frick could answer, I asked Buck how he knew him, what his connection was to me, what he was doing in this spooky ass elevator. 9.08.50 AM. How do I know him? Buck scoffed, shaking his head. This is the man who murdered me. Wait, 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 wait. Hold up, hold up, hold the hell on. My brother on Sean's name. You serious? Wait, what? Wait, wait, wait. What? You heard me, right? See Frick here? Buck paused. Why they call you that anyways? He asked, sidetracked. It's really Frank. Twin sister Francis, Frick and Frack. Came from my uncle. Stupid shit old men call you stick in the hood. Frick explained. Who you telling? Matter of fact, because of you. Buck paused again, turned back to me. Because of him, Will, the only person, the only reason people around here know my government name is from reading it on my damn tombstone. Buck's real name was James. I've only heard it one time. Buck better than James. Buck short for young Buck. Nickname given as, as a stepfather as a joke. Because Buck couldn't grow no facial hair. Smooth baby face, nothing rough about it. Buck was two-sided. Two dads, step and real. Step raised him, a preacher, a real preacher, not scared of no one, praying for anyone, helping everyone. Real ran through him, a bank robber, would steal air from the world if he could get his hands on it. People always said he was taught to do good, but doing bad was in his blood. And there's that nighttime mom always be talking about. It'll snatch your teaching from you. Put a gun in your hand, a grumble in your gut, and some sharp in your teeth. But he didn't start that way. At first, Buck was a small-time hustler, dime bags on the corner. Same old story until my pop got popped at the payphone that night. Then he became a big brother to Sean and a robber to a bunch of suburban neighborhoods every morning. He knew better than, jack than to jack the people around here and came back with money the most, sneakers the best, and jewelries, which he loved to show off. Back to Frick. I was shocked when I heard that this dude killed Buck. Yeah. Buck said, hand on Frick's shoulder, all buddy-buddy. This, the guy, he glanced at me. Sean never told you that story? He never really talked about it, I said. Sean just said you were shot and that he knew who did it. I explained, remembering that time Sean's face, a candle melt, melted wax, flame flickering out. 
I remember the cops banging on our door to question him, to tell him they heard he was close to James. That was the one time I heard Buck's real name, and to ask him if he knew who might have done it, killed him, shot him, twice, in the stomach, in the street. Sean ain't say nothing, to the cops, to no one, just locked himself in his room for hours, and the next day I caught him sitting on his bed, pushing bullets into gun clips. 9.08.54 a.m. Well, let me tell you, Buck said. We were hanging out at the court, sharing a bottle of something cheap and strong just before it went down, Buck said. Sean was telling me how he had gotten into a little scuffle, nothing major, with one of the dudes from the Dark Suns. Buck said, said he had to get your mother some kind of soap she uses that he could only get from the store down by where they hang out. A dumb thing to say. Would have been to tell Buck how important the soap was that had stopped Mom from scrapping loose a river of wounds. But instead, I just said, Riggs. I'm not sure what his name is, Buck said. Said Sean, and he was going to the store when the dude ran up on him talking all this shit. Said it was nothing serious, just popping off at the mouth about how he was a dark son and how Sean ain't belong around here said Sean, was in his feelings, all huff-huff, explaining to Buck how he had grown up with the kid, Riggs, and how he, how the kid was brand new. Buck said he told Sean to let it roll off, but he couldn't because that's just how he was, all emotional, all the time, Buck said. While he's going on about this dude, I'm trying to show him this chain I just got from some kid out in the burbs. Didn't even snatch it. I just growled a little bit and asked for it, and the sucker just took it. Right off and handed it to me. Ain't even snatch it, Buck said, thinking back on the day like he still couldn't believe it. But what does that have to do with my brother and this guy, I said, pointing to Frick. Hold on, I'm getting to that. So because Sean was tripping so hard about this dude, I gave him the gold chain, Buck said proud. A gift, his first one. Then Sean left the basketball court. And that's when I came, Frick chimed in, a big smile on his face, like he had just won some kind of award. How to become a dark sun. One, turf, nine blocks from where I live. Two, the shining, a cigarette burn under the right eye. Three, dark deed, robbing someone, beating someone, or the worst, killing someone. Note, apparently you also don't got to be corny. I was assigned my dark deed for initiation, Frick explained, and it was to kill Buck? No, he said. Funny thing is, I was just supposed to rob him. I didn't think it was a funny thing at all. Everybody knew Buck was always flossing, always flashy, but nobody would touch him because of his pops, both of them, real and step. Gangsters. Always respect older, original, gangsters, OGs, and preachers who act like gangsters. Frick said. His plan was to jack the jack boy, said he knew Buck would be at the court. So he ran up on him, pulled the hammer, and got laughed at. Buck said. He couldn't get got by a dude who he could tell was as soft as the suburban joker he'd just jacked. Everybody in the elevator laughed, except me. 9.08.58 a.m. Whatever, man, Frick said. I was just trying to earn my stripes. Can't knock me for that. He turned around, caught eyes with Pop and Uncle Mark. They nodded in agreement. No judgment over here, Uncle Mark said, throwing his hands up. Anyway, this crazy fool, Buck, swings at me, just tries to take me, even though I had a boomstick. Frick looked at Buck, shook his head, and then cut his eyes to me. I got scared, so I pulled the trigger. Buck bent, his pinky and ring finger back, and turned his hand into a gun. Bang, bang. Again, what does this have to do with Sean? I asked. Sean stuck to the rules, Frick replied. You mean, I swallowed, you mean he, he, I struggled to get it out. Now Buck put the finger gun against Frick's chest and repeated, bang, bang. Actually, he only pulled the trigger once, so it was more like bang, Frick corrected. 15 bullets. Took me out. Before I ever even got my shine in, Frick said, rubbed just under his right eye like it still rubbed him the wrong way. Frick yanked his collar down. See this? He asked, exposing a hole in his chest, dime-sized, disgusting, bloody, but not bleeding. Your brother's fingerprints are in there somewhere. 
Buck had replied before I had a chance, and I bet it's his middle finger. When the joke was over, I asked how Sean sh couldn't know Frick was the guy who killed Buck. Buck said there was only one other person at the court that night, always there all, all the time. A young kid running back and forth, trying to dunk, not shoot. He said he thinks, I might have known him, Tony. And he wasn't trying to dunk, he was trying to fly. Tony talking ain't the same as snitching. Snitching is bumping gums to badges, but, not, but Tony ain't run to no cops or cried to no cameras, nothing like that. Tony talking was laying claim loyalty and allegiance to the asphalt around here and attempt to grow taller, get bigger, one way or another. 9.09 a.m. Now let me ask you, how you know this is Ridge that got your brother? Buck fired back because he clearly got revenge for, for Sean talking out this guy. I pointed to Frick. Frick, you know a, na a kid named Riggs? Danny asked out of nowhere, her voice floating over my shoulder. Little dude, big mouth, dark son. I figured the description might help. Frick looked at me confused. Who? Anagram number five. I wish I knew an anagram for poser. Frick looked at me out like I was crazy. Shrugged his shoulders and turned around and faced the door. Couldn't see his reflection, couldn't see any of their reflections. Just mine blurred. Frick had his own cigarettes and his own matches. Finally, 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 the elevator came to a stop. When the elevator door opened, no one was there. So I reached over and pushed the L button again and again and again and again. Because that's what you do when you want the door to close faster. Another one of those elevator rules. Come on. I huffed under my breath, impatient, pissy, pissed off, scared and straight up uncomfortable being crammed in this stupid steel box, this vertical coffin, another second. Uncle Mark chuckled. You, nev you would never survive in prison, nephew. Finally, the elevator door began closing. I exhaled happily. We were almost there, one floor to go. And just before it was shut, before the door clicked in place, four fingers slipped, just barely catching it, the elevator door began opening again. 9.09 a.m., him. Sean stepped into the smoky box wearing exactly what he wore the night before. Blue jeans, t-shirt, gold chain. But not his alive outfit, his dead one. The one that came with blood stains. Everybody was so happy to see him. Sean! Buck yelped, reaching out for him. They slapped hands. Buck fiddled with the gold chain around Sean's neck, moved the class to the back. Sean looked at Denny. Look at you. He said, taking her hand, spinning her around. Uncle Mark gave him a light tap on the ribs. Big man, he said proudly. Sean turned and gave him a hug. Caught a glimpse of our father. Pop, he said, natural face, his face beaming. Our father wrapped his arms around Sean, cocooning him, then pulled away, shook hands like men, like partners. All, the unalive undead lined up along the wall, puffing their cigars, smiling as Sean finally finally face me. When we were kids, I would follow Sean around the apartment, making the strangest noise in my mouth. Hard to explain the sound. Burpy, but not a burp. Like a burp mixed with a yawn, mixed with a hum. Something like that. For 20 minutes straight, from bedroom to kitchen, to living room, back to bedroom. To punish me, he would wait for me to finish, to run out of steam, to let it go, to get tired of being immature, and then to my surprise, he wouldn't say a word to me for the rest of the day. I looked at Sean, he looked at me. Sean, I said, but he said nothing. I repeated, Sean, nothing. I stepped toward him, hugged him. He didn't hug back. He just stood there, awkward, a middle drawer of a man. I asked him why he wouldn't say nothing, why he was ignoring me, but still nothing, not a word, not even a smile. I told him about the drawer, the gun, what I did, like he told me, like Buck told him, like our grandfather told our uncle, like our uncle told our dad. I followed the rules, at least the first two. I hadn't cried, I hadn't snitched. Explained that I was on my way to take care of his killer. Followed through the rule number three. I told him I knew it was Riggs. I told him I thought it was Riggs. Then I told him I knew it was Riggs, again. Confessed that I was scared, that I needed to know I was doing the right thing. The rules are the rules, right? Right? Sean? I was breaking down. The tears were coming, and I did what I could to hold them back. I took my eyes off Sean, hoping the, 
to fight the crying feeling by not looking. But everywhere else was everyone else. Cigarettes glowing, a bunch of L buttons. 9.09 AM. I look back at Sean, tears now pouring from his eyes as he softly snotted and hiccuped like a little kid. Tears pouring from his eyes. Tears pouring from his eyes. Tears pouring from his eyes. I thought you said no crying, Sean. I said, voice cracking, one of my tears bursting free, but only one, so it didn't count. No crying, no crying, no crying. And even though his face was wet with tears, he wasn't supposed to cry when he was alive. I couldn't see him as anything less than my brother, my favorite, my only. And there was a sound, like whatever makes elevators work, the cables and cogs or whatever, grinding, rubbing metal on metal, like a machine moaning but coming from the mouth, from the belly of Sean. He never said nothing to me, just made the painful piercing sound as the sudden elevator came to a stop. Random thought number five. The sounds you hear in your head, the one people call ears ringing, sounds less like a bell, more of a flat line. There was a moment before the door opened, just when we all stood there, sickening smoke thickening, crowded in, this cell, this coffin, this elevator, quiet. I looked around, only seeing the orange glow of five cigarettes puncturing the sheet of smoke like headlights in heavy fog. Only five cigarettes? Sean hadn't lit one became invisible in the cloud, and I felt like the cigarette meant for him was burning in my stomach, filling me with a stinging fire. 9.09 a.m. I want out. The door opens slowly. The cloud of smoke rushing out of the elevator, rushing out of me like an angry wave. I caught my breath as Buck, Danny, Uncle Mark, Pop, Frick, and Sean chased behind it. The L button no longer lit. I stood alone in an empty box. Tight face from dried tears, jean soggy, a loaded gun, still tucked in my waistband. Sean turned back toward me, eyes dull from death, but shining from tears, finally spoke to me. Just two words like a joke he'd been saving. You coming? <laughs>